All right, so welcome to the January 27th TSC call. Uh, as you are probably all aware, there are two things that uh, you must abide by in joining this call. The first one is the antitrust policy notice that is displayed on the screen. And the second one is our code of conduct, uh, which is linked in the agenda. Um, the code of conduct basically says, don't be a uh, jerk and uh, make sure to take into account everybody's different opinions and ideas. So uh, we have three announcements today. Uh, the first announcement here is one that is always on our agenda. Uh, just a, a reminder to everybody that the Dev Weekly Developer Newsletter goes out on Friday. And if there's anything that you would like to reach the hundreds of Hyperledger developers, please click on that link and leave a comment and uh, we'll get the information in that newsletter that goes out. Uh, the second one is, uh, as you are probably aware from our conversation, I think it was two weeks ago, uh, the Hyperledger Challenge has kicked off and they're looking for mentors across um, all of the different areas within Hyperledger so if you're interested in being a mentor, there is a link there for you to click on and uh, volunteer your time. And then the last uh, announcement here, I'm going to let Min talk us through. Yeah, thank you, Tracy. So to continue the theme of mentoring here, uh, so the uh, Hyperledger Foundation, we're um, launching the 2022 mentorship program uh, on February 1st, and that starts uh, starts with the uh, call for mentors and project proposals. Um, if you can click on that link, that will take you to the uh, Hyperledger mentorship program on the wiki page. Um, this is actually the sixth year that we're doing this program. This is a formal mentorship program. It's part of the Linux Foundation uh, mentor mentorship uh, initiative. Uh, actually, over the uh, the last five six years, we have uh, for Hyperledger we have steadily increasing the funding and the number of um, uh, for this program and the number of mentors and mentees who are involved in this program have also steadily increased as well. Uh, just to give you some data points, if I look at 2021, we funded 20, uh, 21 projects, um, more than, I think we have close to 30, uh, some mentors involved, uh, 22 mentees involved. Um, all projects except one were successfully completed. And I'm hoping, um, you know, just from the project presentations that I heard at the end of last year and uh, the majority of the mentees are planning to continue. I hope they're still involved in the uh, Hyperledger community. So this is a great opportunity, right, for to connect uh, those who are active in the community, who want to mentor, who want to teach uh, with those who want to get their foot into the Hyperledger open source community. So um, we're so as I mentioned, we're going to be uh, sending out the call for mentors and project proposals um, next week, uh, February 1st. Uh, the project, uh, so Tracy, if you want to click on the pro program timeline. Um, thank you. Um, so uh, let's see. Yeah, so starting from February 1st through March 9th, that's the uh, project proposal time uh, phase. And then we'll have about two weeks um, to review uh, all the project proposals that we receive. And then uh, once we approve the project proposals, we'll put on the uh, Linux Foundation, it's called ElfX Mentorship Platform uh, to accept mentee applications uh, for six weeks. And then we'll have two weeks period for the mentors to review all the applications that came in and select the mentees that they would like to work with. And then all the mentorship will officially start on June 1st. And the mentees can participate either as a full-time or part-time mentee. So those are the timelines for the full-time um, program and the part-time uh, program. As I mentioned, uh, actually even on the TSC roster, I know, uh, Many of you uh, actually have been involved in this program. So I hope many of you will uh, get involved this year as well, if you have time, if you're interested. Um, yeah, 
And also, if you have any questions, I did put on the TSC agenda, please contact mentorship at hyperledger.org. Um, and uh, I, I, I'm on that alias, I'm watching that. So if you have any questions, I'll, I'll respond from there. Or if you have any questions today. Yes, Daniela. Hi, I just want to let everybody know that the MIN has been you know, fantastic and amazing over the last few years running this uh, mentorship program, continues to grow it, continues to support the mentors and the mentees. It's really amazing. You know, looking across the Linux Foundation, I think the Hyperledger uh, mentee program is you know, probably the one that is you know, the best managed and just fantastic. So hats off to Min. Thank you so much. Um, and that's why we continue to invest in, in this. Um, as Min said, this is a great opportunity for all the project leads to you know, to put forward a proposal for work that they are doing or want to be doing um, to get some, um, some assistance and more importantly to bring in new talent, new contributors and new maintainers to our community. So I really encourage everyone to do that. Um, and if anybody has questions about, you know, what does it take to be a mentor? What should I do? Uh, please reach out to Min or anybody on staff. And there's also a listing on, on the wiki kind of feedback that Min has gathered from a lot of the other uh, mentors over the years that uh, would be helpful. Uh, the other thing is that David Boswell and Rye Jones and Sean Bowen are going to be um, just looking as well um, at some of the project reports that have been done over the last few quarters to see if there's opportunities just to reach out to the maintainers, even if they're not on this call today, and having them participate. So uh, please um, think through who in the community, if not yourself, could leverage this program. This is paid through our member membership uh, uh, you know, funds, and we want to make sure that everyone in the community can leverage it. So you know, Min, I can't thank you enough. I know you get a lot of kudos across the LF when we're talking about mentorship program, but I want to you know, say this in front of the technical steering committee without your assistance over the last few years, we couldn't have had, you know, 20 projects deliver code and, and hopefully new contributors to the project. So thank you. Yeah, thanks, Daniela. Yeah, thanks for adding in uh, additional data points and also encouraging um, everybody to leverage this program. It's funded through our, yes, membership funds. And uh, it, it, it's, it's been a yeah great experience for me to just to see, you know, uh, all the contributions coming in from the mentees and getting the mentors and mentees uh, connected to this program. So thank you very much. And thank you, Tracy, as well. <laughs> You're, uh, you have always helped me with the wiki setup uh, for this program as well. So thank you. Yeah, great. Thanks, Min. Thanks, Daniela. Any questions for Min uh, on the men mentorship program? All right, seeing no questions. Uh, are there any other announcements that anybody on the call would like to make? All right, seeing no hands, uh, nobody coming off mute. I will uh, then move us on to the, the quarterly reports. Uh, so we do have uh, three links here. Uh, the Southeast one just showed up yesterday. So I, I noticed this morning that not everybody has had the opportunity to review that yet. Um, and then the, the caliper and the fabric uh, one came in uh, on time for us to review. And I see that most of us have reviewed it. I did not see any specific questions on any of the reports. Uh, although Arno, I did see your comment about um, the code of conduct on the sawtooth one. But are there any questions or comments, things that we should take back to the maintainers or the project report filers on these project reports? So Tracy, I, I actually wanted to highlight for everybody to see in case they haven't seen my comment. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, this is a case where the so two team reports, they have not really implemented the common repository structure. They're missing the code of conduct. The change log, you know, I can see the argument. They feel like they are, you know, achieving the same result in a different way. And I can give them a break on this. On the other, they, on the other hand, the code of conduct, I mean, now it's been several months we have been, you know, we have asked the groups, the, the, all the different projects to align the repository with the common rep, uh, repository structure we have defined. And I, I, I have to admit my patience is running uh, thin on that one. I feel like this is a very low hanging fruit and they should make the effort and 
you know, I wonder at one point we start, you know, showing a bit of like, uh, I don't know, you call this like, <laughs> we put a bit more pressure on the project to say, come on, get your act together, please. Yeah, you know, Arno, I was just thinking as you were talking, it might just be worthwhile to create a PR. Um, I think that if I'm not mistaken, our code of conduct just will point to the code of conduct that we have that is standard. Um, so it might be a really easy PR for us to, uh, to I put agree. out there. And the thought that also crossed my mind, I was like, you know, it probably wouldn't take much, but at the same time, I felt like, wait, <laughs> why should it's i do the this? point <laughs> this is, it's you know it's easy enough for them to do it they should they want to be part of hyperledger they have to you know we don't ask much from the project i think this is a very small thing they ought to do all right thanks Arno. uh any other comments on any of the the project reports arun Hey, so, so some of the reports I keep repeatedly saying that they are looking for more maintainers to get started with their project. So um, instead of taking a passive approach, I guess, how about taking an active approach where we know the list of newly proposed projects on the labs. And so far our ask has been whenever a new project proposal comes in the labs, we ask them to check with one of the existing projects and see if they meet their requirements and then join them, right? So on the other side, we now see many of these projects are requesting additional support. They say we don't have enough maintainers or we need more contributors. So how about we ask the projects as well to do the same thing? If we identify a new project proposal, which falls in line with those, we should probably intimate those, those project teams and ask them to go and look, have a talk to those teams who are proposing a new project. Maybe they, there is a potential for expanding the project scope or there could, it, it may all end up to be a new project altogether, but it should be more active from the project teams if they are looking for more contributors. So, yeah, thanks Arun. I think the, the comment or the, the suggestion is um a good one i guess the question is are we asking the maintainers to do that are we asking the lab stewards to do that who 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 is the ask to that we try to connect the maintainers to these lab projects or labs um so the the first point of contact will still be lab stewards because they um keep a close eye on new labs being proposed however they don't they're not entitled to handle this throughout right for example um, you being a lab steward, you identify a new project proposed and you you know basically the area or the domain that it falls under. You can notify um, somebody from the project team that, hey, here is a new project. I would like you to get in touch with them. Okay. Yeah, it's mostly the lab stewards then. Okay. Yeah, I, I know um, Arno and I try very hard in the, the comments for the labs, right, to, to make those connections. Um, but I don't think we specifically call out maintainers for the projects. We, we try to put that more on the labs, um, the people who are suggesting the labs to, to have that conversation. But I think, uh, you know, we won't be able to tag them, tag the maintainers in GitHub. It'll have to be a separate process because they are two different organizations. All right, any other comments on the project reports then? All right, so let's uh, then move on to our discussion items. Um, and just a reminder for anybody who might be talking to the ARIES or the Indy community, their reports are due next week. Um, so the, the first discussion item that we have here is one that we started last week, but didn't make it very far through. Um, it really is a question around how do we um, encourage projects to graduate 
Um, and do we have enough benefits to offer to our uh, projects as they work through the life cycle? I think we were having a conversation at the end of last week around um, two sorts of things. One, Arno had suggested that maybe instead of adding additional benefits, maybe it's removing benefits. Um, but there's a tension there because we want the incubated projects to really you know, be successful in uh, gathering a community, uh, do, doing the work necessary to figure out how to, you know, work their way towards the incubation exit criteria so that they can graduate. Uh, so there's a, a bit of a tension there um, surrounding that. And so I think, you know, that's that's really the the two pieces that we, we talked about last week um, in our conversations. And so I want to kind of continue this conversation, see if anybody has come up with any sort of additional benefits that they might uh, think are useful to offer to our graduated projects um, versus the incubated projects. Uh, and also then maybe take a look at some of the, the suggestions that David has provided in the um, in that wiki page as well, which I copied here uh, to make it easier for us to reference. So let's start with the question of, are there any additional benefits that anybody has come up with that we think we should offer to graduated projects? Anything that would incentivize our projects to um, move towards graduated heart? Thanks, Tracy. I think David's suggestions are really good here. So like workshops, uh, translation stuff. Um, <clears throat> I think there's a lot of marketing stuff that we could probably restrict to graduated projects. Okay. Anything else that anybody thinks would be good to add as incentives? I will point out that on the notes that I put on there, thank you for copying those over, Tracy. I did change them yesterday. I had an opportunity to talk to somebody at TNCF yesterday. So if you read those earlier or last week, the, the documentation and translation ones have been changed somewhat to provide more details about what they do. So I'll just cover those really quick just so people know. CNCF has a project services doc similar to what we're talking about doing, and they do include translation and documentation support on that. And I was really curious about what that meant. It was not, they didn't go into a lot of details on the doc itself. So I wanted to talk to somebody there. They do invest funds there and they do a range of things. Um, not so much documentation directly, although it sounds like they do have some staff do that to bootstrap some things. A lot of it is more coordination efforts, which is similar to what we did last year around the fabric translation work with the documentation. So there's a lot of coordinating efforts that could be done. So for example, one thing they said is Google offers a, a season of code program. And so somebody on staff can manage that and apply for that and make sure that they get into that program. So that's that coordination effort is something for us to consider. Something else they did that I also thought was really interesting and I have a link there though. They also have, um, what they call doc assessment. So to have somebody go in and review the state of a project's documentation and analyze that and provide recommendations. So some, you know, I think giving some sort of roadmap and support and guidance to a project about what documentation they should focus on, what documentation would be helpful. So I think those give some more details. I think my notes had initially said, hey, we should probably do something around documentation and translation because that's critical, which I think it is, but at least this is a little bit more concrete and specific to see what another Linux Foundation project is doing. So just, just to flag that, that, I added those notes last night and people may not have seen that because uh, that was just a recent addition. But I do think like the assessments and the coordination and organization support could be really, really valuable in terms of the documentation and translation. Yeah, and I will, um, because Bobby's not here, uh, I'm pretty sure that the uh, learning materials working group um, was also looking at trying to help the different projects with their documentation and improving those. Um, so I, I mean, I definitely think improving documentation is a good thing. I will, um, 
I will kind of go back to, I think it was Arno last, no, maybe it was Hart last week. I don't know. One of the two of you said something about that tension, right? Between helping um, projects that are incubated kind of work their way up. And I will say that this particular one for improving documentation seems like a really strong sort of thing that a lot of incubated projects might need help with, right? Um, improving their documentation so that people can get up to speed quickly, bring up their development environments, whatever the case may be, right? Um, so just for something to, to consider, right? How do, we, how do we ensure that as we are trying to help our incubated projects that we're not um, doing them a disservice, I guess, in this particular regards with documentation? And, and so, you're right. I, Sorry, go ahead, Arno. No, no I, I wanted to follow up. I mean, I sure did uh, talk about this tension, and I think this is indeed a, a bit of a challenge at the same time. Um, I, you know, so I, as you, as you reminded everybody, I, I did say that maybe there's also a way which is to remove some of the benefits we already grant to incubation project. And we didn't really talk so much about it uh, because we then shifted to more like, oh, maybe we should, you know, rescind projects to a different level, which is yet another completely different thing to do. But I, I, I do think I've looked at the set of, of criteria or, or the benefits that we have for each stage. And I do think it's an interesting, uh, there is maybe ways we can reduce a little bit some of the benefits. And I think maybe what a, should be a driving factor for this is whether it, you know, it, how much it costs the organization to, 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 to provide those services. I mean, obviously there are things that are, you know, pretty free. I mean, like, you know, create a Twitter account. It's like, okay, that takes a few minutes for staff to do it. And, uh, you know, it doesn't cost anything. On the other end, if we look at, you know, training courses, I guess this is pretty expensive uh, thing to do. Um, security audits are also expensive. There's an actual cost. And so I think there are a few things like this we could definitely say, well, you know what? Yeah, these things are nice to have, but incubation projects are not going to get this. They only get that if you graduate. The documentation improvement, I'm kind of on the edge because I agree with what you said, uh, uh, Tracy. It, it would definitely help them <laughs> to have better documentation, but you know, maybe it's there's only so much you can offer. Yeah, I like I like the idea, Arno, of uh, cost being a, a deciding factor for some of these things. Um, David, I saw you come off mute again. And I was going to say, it doesn't have to be an either or situation. We could provide a lower amount of support at one level and a higher amount of that sort of support at another. You know, it's not to say, hey, if this is a, a documentation and translation support, it's a service we give to graduated projects. That doesn't mean we give nothing of that to the incubation, maybe just a, a smaller amount, you know, maybe more of a, a bootstrap versus a, a full, you know, service that we would give to a graduated project. Yeah, makes sense. Okay, any other, yeah, Arun? Sorry, I just asked that question on the chat box as well. So I was curious, since we are talking about the cost implications for graduated projects, and we know um, we do have mentorship options uh, through Linux Foundation. I was curious if, Hy if Hyperledger would anyway be willing to have um, additional developers in, in case a project is willing to go into graduated state. So when I say additional developer support, it could be for multiple needs, right? For example, some of those projects may want, um, um, maybe they are going silent for a few days or maybe they're looking for additional developers to help them on a short sprint. Is, is there such a provision? I may not be very sure if this is like TSA scope, but just curious to learn more. I know in the past, um, we Hyperledger has been pretty clear about um, not 
paying you know developers to work on projects uh this sounds like something slightly different uh daniela i like to hear the comments of the if anybody else has comments before commenting but I, 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 I do have something to say, but does anybody else have anything to say that's not on staff? So uh, I'll just point to a couple of things that I've seen recently in the community that you know, I've also seen over the last four and a half years. Um, there are incentives and programs. Um, for example, I saw that the government of British Columbia um, just awarded uh, um, uh, a contract to uh, Indicio in our community to do some work specific to Hyperledger Indie and DIDS. Um, so, you know, this is our community member, right? The, the government of British Columbia is actually an associate member of Hyperledger. Um, they needed um, some, some work done, you know, that is to the benefit of the whole community. Um, and that funding came directly from that government. There's also some other ones happening in Europe that we continually see. So I think, you know, we need to find, you know, uh, ways to make these types of grants and the ways to, um, to, to figure out ways to, to fund, you know, some development work. Coming out of specifically, you know, to Rise Point um, around uh, budget, so membership uh, dollars that are uh, brought in from, from our members, um, we have not funded any development. We do fund resources like Rye and Sean and others on staff to help assist. Um, we can, you know, find creative ways to support more mentorships. We just increased it by four this year um, and making sure that the projects take advantage of that. Um, so there, there are different ways that we can do, but, um, you know, across the Linux Foundation, it's very limited when um, we do pay for work, uh, for development work. Thanks, Diana. I think that I think the mentorship um, piece is key, right? Um, it sounds like that's a really good way for us to, if you will, fund certain development. Um, but it does require the input from people in the community to be mentors. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think you know, uh, it wouldn't necessarily sound like we could say, "Hey, well, graduated projects get priority" or something like that. Um, because it's really going to depend on who shows up to, to be the mentor. Mm -hmm. and, and just a reminder, the TSC chooses who gets selected for those, you know, for the, you know, the, uh, the project development projects. So um, maybe a follow-up question or a slightly modified version of my earlier question. So let's keep aside the development aspect for, for us for a while. And how about the other other benefit, other routine tasks that a project needs to go through. And it could be along with documentation. Um, maybe some of the projects, they are so occupied that they need somebody's help in, in managing their projects and, and in terms of organizing them. Or um, maybe that's an incentive that a graduated project gets. Like we could support them in their release management aspects so, th so that they completely focus on the development or the technical aspects, the other aspects should would be taken care of as a benefit. Is that something feasible or again, that falls under the same category? I think we can take a look at that and see what is required. Yeah, I, I mean, I guess um, not not to shut it down a room, um, but I do want to just provide some some thoughts on that. Um, that will probably seem contrary and, and they're not necessarily meant to be contrary, but more to start discussion, uh, which is that if you think about one of the things that it takes to move from incubate it to graduate it, it is that the project has figured out how to do releases, right? They've um, figured out what the release process looks like. They figured out how to, to manage that release process and go through uh, a couple of releases before um, they're allowed to exit incubation. That's one of the, the criteria that we have. 
Um, so I guess, you know, my mind says if if now we're offering to graduate at projects that once they've figured out how to do that, they don't have to do that anymore. Uh, this seems a bit wrong or contrary to to kind of why we wanted that in the incubation exit criteria in the first place. Sure. Um, yeah, I understand your, your point. Uh, but if that is an I mean, option open, then we could definitely start looking into aspects that projects struggle with, and we can incentivize them if they graduate, if, if any such support is extendable apart from documentation. Maybe not yeah, just I, I the think, document. But... I think you're exactly right. Like, what, are the, what are the things that um, projects are challenged with? And taking a look at those might be the sort of thing that will allow us to understand what we should add to the list. I agree. Yeah, that would be great. And that sort of feedback is certainly welcome. Yeah, what support is helpful. I have one uh, one last comment. If if we just before we move on, I do want to share that uh, um, I do think the workshops are going to be a very big incentive at the graduated level. But I know that might not seem that way because it's a new concept and we haven't really done these before. I will just flag that we did the first workshop last week and Sean and I are doing some analysis. We're gonna do the second workshop next week. So probably the week after that, Sean and I will come and provide some data points about how those went, but the early indications are those are very helpful, both in terms of helping a project connect with people who wanna use it as well as contribute to it. Just without much promotion, the Aries, we had the CAF Aries one, around 400 people expressed interest in going. The ND one is just under that. I think it's around 360, 370 right now. And again, we haven't really been promoting it that much. We just announced a fabric workshop. So we're gonna have a lot of data points to look at about do these work, are they effective, but the early indications are good. So just to flag that, I do think going forward, that is gonna be something that provides a lot of value. But I realized just looking at that document that might not seem that way, because again, it's a new concept. There's no real track history to look at, so to speak. But we'll we'll follow up with the TSC with some data points in two weeks. OK, great. Just a, a quick thing. Uh, Those are funded. Um, they're not volunteer, because I know we've done a lot of these similar things over the years from a volunteer perspective. These are funded uh, projects, uh, uh, workshops, I'm sorry. OK, great. Peter? I just wanted to add the plus one to that uh, carrot idea for helping with release management for projects as a maintainer of one of the projects who's in incubation. I actually already have been on the community architects mailing list asking for a bunch of help regarding release management. And I, I did get a lot of help as well. And to me, that was very, very helpful. And moving us towards uh, the graduated state. And if that didn't exist, it would have been much harder. And and I think as a carrot, it would be good if there could be even more of it because there's a lot to, there's a lot that goes into release management just by itself. All right, thanks Peter for the plus one. Any other thoughts or comments? All right, so before we move off this topic, um, David, Daniela, staff members, is this a useful discussion for you? Do we need to? discuss anything further? Hey, what, what are your thoughts as far as next steps for this particular item? It has been useful for sure. I mean, getting people's feedback about the balance, what's the right balance between the, you know, supporting incubation versus incentivizing the release management idea is something worth looking into. Appreciate the feedback on the docs. I mean, yeah, this was great. I think we will take it and polish it and then share it back. Okay, great. 
Well, if anybody does come up with anything else as they're, uh, you know, in the in the shower or, you know, not thinking about this at all and it pops into your head, uh, definitely let David know. And uh, I'm sure he would appreciate that input. All right, so then the next item that we have on our agenda is uh, that Jim a few weeks back had um, made a comment that he would make some suggestions on, on things that we might do to update the template of the quarterly reports. Um, as we you know, started this discussion, it was really around what do we do when we don't get uh, project reports and the concern that um, maybe they were too onerous to complete for some of our projects or the projects didn't see anything useful coming out of the fact that they're doing these project reports. Um, so, you know, a few weeks back, we had a couple weeks back, I think we put together the list of why this is important. Um, and this was Jim's follow up action for taking a look at the template and seeing that there's things that that might be at it. Um, I think at that point, we were talking about how we might automate some of this stuff. And uh, I did reach out specifically to the insights team about whether or not an API might be available for us to utilize to bring in some of the insights specifically into our project reports. They do not currently have an API, although it is on their roadmap. Um, so maybe, you know, as we have this conversation, we can talk about the sorts of things that might be useful in an API, as well as the things that people tend to look at to see if they can understand the health of projects. Um, Jim has provided in, he actually updated the, the last Firefly quarterly report and he added three links at the top um, focused on these three dimensions around project health, specifically for uh, commit activity, PR activity and contributor strength. Um, and I guess the, the question to uh, the TSC is, do we think these are the right dimensions? And then um, I would just kind of point out that in general, these links um, are generic links. They're not related to the specific time frame. Um, so that could also be something that we look at as we go through and try and figure out what is the um, information that we, we want to see and how do we automate these links so that people don't have to type them in every time or figure out how to, to put the right data in. So, um, yeah. Are these dimensions things that people look at when they review the, the insights that are linked in the project reports or are there other sorts of dimensions that people, um, that people think are more interesting or, or useful to have a look at? Could somebody summarize what contributor strength is? Sorry. <laughs> so that's, um, I. if we look here at uh, what they have, it's basically, it says it's the growth in the aggregate account of unique contributors during that selected time period. So in this case, the last three months. Um, so anybody who's added any sort of code activity or um, helped in resolving bugs. So looks like for Firefly, I think this was Firefly's trend um, for the last three months, they've had 53 um, as far as contributors go. Unique contributors. Peter? There's two more metrics that I like person that are interesting to me usually. Uh, one of them is how the number of open issues have changed, how many got closed and how many new got opened and what is the total as of right now. That, that always throws an interesting uh, trend on whether it's trending up or down in total, but also how much work is, is being done roughly. And then the other one, is uh, about timings related to pull requests. So it's not, it's a set of metrics, not just a single metric that I saw on the LFX uh, 
and the set of metrics contain how much time does it take to review pull requests, how much time does it take to merge them after they've been reviewed, uh, how much time did they spend uh, in non-reviewed state versus how many back and forth were during the reviews. Uh, I think I remember seeing these kind of metrics. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm quoting them exactly right, but uh, you know, I'm, I'm giving you the pro structs. It's basically about PR timings, which means how active the maintainer community is in making sure that uh, if someone comes in with a contribution, then they get the attention they need to actually get that through over the finish line. Yep. Okay, thanks, Peter. Part. Yeah, so I was going to say, Peter, that's exactly, I, I agree with you, and it's in the technical metrics. So if you're on the trends page, which I, I, Rai is like moving towards some of the specific technical metrics uh, on the screen. But yeah, you can see sort of all of these things like, um, you know, who's committing and what org are they from? Who's making PRs? What org are they from? You can sort you know, you can see like, are some orgs responding to PRs and things faster than others? Um, all of this stuff. And I think it's just really good. Um, I love these tools. Um, I've used them to go to Fujitsu management many times. Um, and I think like this sort of, the, the technical metrics page of the, um, of the LFX insights is is basically you know a lot of what you want to know for a quarterly report, um, and as Peter you're pointing out you know from this page we we can essentially you know it's very easy to see whether a project is healthy or not just from looking at this page. Okay. Uh, so issue trends, PR timing, uh, heart, you, you mentioned organizations um, in the technical metrics as well. Um, I think that lends itself to the diversity question that we have within our current project reports. Um, other sorts of things that people tend to look at when they uh, click on that insight link to see how the project's doing. Or I think if, that if anyone else wants to drive, I can stop sharing, you know, instead of my trying to do an interpretive <laughs> thing. If, if someone else wants to share and show, I'll, I'll stop sharing. Uh, Ardo? So I, actually, I, I, I wanted to, 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 to propose and, you know, <laughs> that's comes handy that I can, I can share uh, some open source tool that actually also capable of analyzing the activity of the repositories in the project and actually it can also provide a very very insightful information with respect to the health status of the of the of the project so if, if you don't mind i can share the screen just to show an, an example because I, i'm you know re recently discovered and was looking on on, on a fabric project but it basically it can provide a lot of information with respect of um, you know diagrams showing the activity during the day it also can 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 identify periods of a very intensive contribution and the the, the light periods of the project there are a very, very few contribu contribution has been done so if you don't mind i can share it and okay. it, 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 it it's 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 worth a kind of exploring to see whenever you would like to 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 use it because again that's a, that's an open source and uh, you know any, anyone can do it and uh, so I, I I just tied it to my to my uh, GitHub account, but you know, so uh, here here I took a few repositories uh, for for Fabric because you know that's the, that's the, pro, the the key project I'm I'm working with. So it has a, a an overall a overview of activity with respect to, and I think it's pretty pretty similar to what we we have seen with LFX Insight. But what it also does, we can we can have an overview of, on uh, actual activity with respect to the uh, to the commits and open issues over the period of, of time. 
and uh, have a drill down, for example, on the commits. So we can we can see amount of commits, and uh, here we actually have a very nice heat map diagram uh, to see then you know what are the most uh, most active uh, hours a, a day within the project uh, with respect in terms of contribution also an uh, analysis of uh, of diagram with you know commits uh, by hours of, of the day commits by weekends uh, the, the the activity across different uh, repositories and also it uh, has like you know we can we can take a look into the issues and see how 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 what what is the period of time it takes for for for, for the contributors spontaneous to respond to the issues? Again, we have here a, a open heat maps for open issue for the closed issues and the a, a, a distribution of that across different repositories. Uh, now it can also analyze the the reviews, the, the activity of uh, how how quickly it has been done. Um, and I, I believe that more, most important, we, we can we can see here also analysis of activity with respect to, to, to the communities. Like, uh, you know, whenever we have a healthy grown community and a, a very active uh, contributors going on, uh, analysis of the of the performance, like time, uh, it, the, the, I think Peter raised these questions like time to, takes to, to close in, on average the issue that was created, how, they, how it takes to, to, to close the issue, uh, re reviews, etc. So we can see millions and average and, 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 and so on. But also it can provide with more, more details because basically they index information into the elastic search and we can hear, see here a more detailized and we can actually customize anything that we would like to. So we can also hear see the people evolution with respect of uh, you know maintainers, uh, the people who is actually uh, keep 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 maintaining the project, uh, contributors that is basically intermediate uh, people who is uh, submitting some some minor changes, users, observers, and so on. Uh, diversity of the community we can also see here, and uh, you know, in in other things, so I I believe that might be very useful to have these reports and uh, you know. Also to include it as a part of the of the health status of the project. And again, that's Thank that's you. that's an uh, that's an open source, and anyone can can just use it. And I believe we, we can also think whenever we would like to adopt it. Yeah, I, I appreciate you sharing this. Um, I haven't seen this tool before, and I have seen a lot of different sorts of tools that try to capture information. Um, I, it seems to me like uh, there are some certain things that people are interested in looking at with regards to project help. Um, I think that, you know, one of the things that might be useful is if we had a, a list of all of the sorts of things that we think would be useful that we could then generate a report from either insights, um, you know, have some sort of uh, maybe we'll work with the LF team to, to you know, generate a particular report that we would be interested in looking at to judge the health um, or, uh, you know, however that might look. And then, um, again, I still think in our project reports, it's useful to have the, the words from the actual people instead of just metrics. Um, metrics can sometimes not show us a full picture. Um, but I think they do give us trends, uh, which are important to see if, you know, the uh, number of commits is trending towards zero. That's probably a bad thing for us, right, for a project. Um, and so I think there's some, some sorts of things that we could look at there. Uh, I guess, you know, maybe, maybe it would be worthwhile uh, to uh, see if we are interested in kicking off a task force related to this to come back with uh, the specifics around the sorts of metrics that we would be interested in taking a look at. Um, or if, uh, you know, there's an interest in this, which there seems to be, uh, I think a lot of people are interested in looking at these metrics to try and figure out what's happening. Um, you know, to me, it seems like maybe the best way is to, to kick off a task force. Thoughts?
So a couple of things I wanted to, uh, the, the first, I mean, I think we could take another look at the report template and maybe mm -hmm. simplify it a little bit anyway. I mean, I, you know, just to try to reduce the amount of work people feel they have to do to fill out those reports. The other yep. thing I wanted to talk about is, is this, you know, you did touch on this earlier is the links that are provided in the reports. Of course, the easy way is to do what Jim did, I believe is like, you know, you get those undated links, right? And yep. what you're going to get when you click that is the, you know, the, the, the status at the moment you click, which, you know, a few months later, it does not represent what it was when, when you publish the report. And I, I honestly don't know about this. I think it's a bit unfortunate if that were the case. I think there is definitely value in, you know, having a link that is specific to the time you make the report. I don't know how much trouble it is for people to change those dates when they go from one report to the other, you know. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you, Arno. I think, you know, having a snapshot of what it is at the time that the report was filed, um, or if we decide that we have to create some tool that will run these on a frequent basis, right, um, putting those into some sort of uh, history repo, whatever you want to call it, that would allow us to take a look back at the different reports that were, were provided. Um, I, I really think that the best way for us to do this is to try and figure out some way to automate that process right, right. By, I think you're here, right. here generate the links that i need uh and then even if it's just a, a stupid web app that says generate the web links for firefly for the last three months from this from the day i click on this right um and then copy those into the report which i don't want to do but you know i just try to make something that is um is very much like there's a way to look back and see what's happened as the projects move forward. Hart. Hey, uh, thanks, Tracy. Um, yeah, I think that this sort of snapshotting is something that um, a lot of people might be interested in. So I think if the if if LFX does give us an API, or I mean, not not just us, everyone. Um, right. It would make sense if snapshotting were, were also included there. So maybe we could, uh, I, I don't know who's point person for the LFX on all of this stuff, um, but perhaps just reaching out and, and mentioning that this would be really useful um, would be a good thing because it's, it's pretty, you know, they have some way of modifying the date internally. So it's just a matter of them exposing this in an API. Um, so, so I think, you know, maybe if we reach out when they do provide an API, so we can actually do this, then, then this might just be a totally moot point. Okay. Uh, good point, Hart. I actually have an email sitting in my inbox that I haven't responded to yet uh, from somebody at um, the LF Insights group who would like to get some feedback on my request for an API. So I think maybe I should set up a call with him and uh, have that conversation and make these sorts of suggestions. But if there's any other sorts of suggestions that you think I should also include, I'm happy to take those as well and provide that in the, the conversation. I mean, just a thought, but I, I think pretty much, I mean, this is REST uh, as far as I can tell. And so everything is in the URL. You could construct the URL and we could have you know, a script I don't know that you need an API per se is what I'm trying to say is maybe documenting the where they build the URL would be good enough. I, I, I do, uh, I just want to caution you that these URLs are not only perishable and, they, and history does change, uh, but there is a lot of work going on right now to move from what you see right now in insights to the next version of insights so i would counsel you to not <clears throat> spend a bunch of time trying to reverse engineer the urls to generate the exact reports that you want 
All right, good uh, to know. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> are you saying that all the links we had already, like in all the past reports, are going to get broken? I I know that that is uh, not what you want to hear, but <laughs> probably. Um, the uh, I don't have the URL off the top of my head, Tracy. I think it's community.dev or community at lfx.dev or something. Um, if you could uh, post that, or I'll look it up after the call and post it um, for the discourse. Uh, I would really like it if everyone on the TSC that has opinions would work directly with the insights development team. And they are paying a lot of attention to that. On our all hands call yesterday for LF, uh, we were you know told to get the community involved and send them there. So I'll do that. I'll give you the URL and get on discourse and let them know what you want. Yeah. And I, you know, I think the other piece of this obviously is uh, Rai, you had sent that link into the TSC mailing list and I had responded with the um, specific uh, item that I had opened there. You know, we can obviously continue the conversation there uh, with the, the folks at the uh, LF Insights so that we capture everything into a single thread about what it is that we're interest at, interested in at Hyperledger. Um, but yeah, I, I definitely think we should continue to, to help the LF Insights dev team to figure out what it is that will be most beneficial for us at Hyperledger. You can remind them All right. that cool URLs don't change. <laughs> Yes, uh, or they should continue to remain somewhat backward compatible, right? Um, yeah, I know it's <laughs> tough, but. All right, uh, so I see we're, we've got just a minute left. Uh, I don't wanna go long like you did last week, but any, um, any last items anybody would like to bring up before we close the call? Oh yes, um, I forgot it during the announcement, but it's a reminder for tomorrow's a task force meeting at 8 a.m. Pacific. All right, so the security task force is meeting tomorrow at 8, eight what was it, 8 p.m., did you say? 8, 8, 8 a.m. Pacific time. I'm sorry, 8 a.m., 8 a.m. Pacific. Um, so feel free to join that call. Uh, the link you should be able to find in the TSC calendar. And um, yeah, I think with that, I will close the call and let you get on to your next meeting for the day. Thank you.